Senior Plasma Physics Lecture 10. We continue looking at electromagnetic waves traveling through a plasma. First we'll look at the wave traveling in a direction perpendicular to an applied magnetic field. Then we'll look at it traveling parallel to the field. And in the process we'll come up with dispersion relations for each situation, which have characteristics called cutoffs and resonances. Then we'll look at a particular part of the dispersion curve known as Whistler waves. Finally, we'll look at waves known as hydromagnetic waves. In particular, those that are called alphane waves. These differ from normal electromagnetic waves through a plasma since the plasma also moves. Let's now look at an electromagnetic wave traveling through a plasma in a direction that's perpendicular to an applied magnetic field. Assume we have a cylindrically symmetric plasma with an axis that's parallel to the applied magnetic field. Let's now apply an electromagnetic wave, represented here by this microwave transmitter horn, with an electric field vector E1 that's parallel to the applied magnetic field B0. This situation where E1 is parallel to B0 is known as an ordinary wave. If we had a situation where E1 was perpendicular to B0, then that's called an extraordinary wave. Let's examine that further. So imagine we have an applied magnetic field B0 along the Z direction. And our electromagnetic wave can either have its electric field vector E1 parallel to B0 or perpendicular to it. Note that the wave here is traveling along the X axis since its k vector is parallel to the x-axis. We call the wave where E1 is parallel to B0 the ordinary wave, and where E1 is perpendicular to B0 is called an extraordinary wave. We now need to obtain dispersion relations for these two situations. And we do it in the usual way. That is, we need to solve a couple of Maxwell's equations, coupled with the linearization of the fluid equations. For details on how this is done for this situation, see section 4.14 in Chen. The final result is that the ordinary wave has this dispersion relation, which is exactly the dispersion relation we saw in a previous lecture for an electromagnetic wave in a plasma without an applied magnetic field. The two are identical. So we won't examine this dispersion relation here further, since we've already done that in previous lectures. However, the extraordinary wave has this dispersion relation, where omega h is the upper hybrid frequency that we've seen before, given by this expression. Let's plot the dispersion curve of the extraordinary wave and look at some of its features. Note that the label on the y-axis, which is the phase velocity v phi squared on the speed of light squared, is nothing more than the inverse of the refractive index squared. Remember that refractive index is the speed of light c divided by the phase velocity v phi. The points at the boundaries of the cross-hatched areas, given by omega l here and omega r, are both called cutoff regions. And the point here at the other boundary of the cross-hatched area given by omega h, the upper hybrid frequency, is called a resonance. The cross-hatched areas mean that the wave can't propagate if it has frequencies in these regions. Let's look at the cutoffs and resonances in more detail. First, the resonance. The resonances occur when the wave number, k, approaches infinity in the dispersion relation. So here is the dispersion relation, this time written as c squared on v phi squared. On the left hand side we can expand the phase velocity v phi in terms of omega on k, and so the left hand side becomes this expression. If k is to go to infinity, that means the denominator on the right hand side must go to zero. From this we can obtain an expression for omega at the resonance. That is, omega squared must equal omega h squared for the denominator to be zero. Recall that omega h is the upper hybrid frequency given by this expression. That includes 
the plasma and electron cyclotron frequencies. Now let's look at cutoffs. Cutoffs occur when the wave number k is equal to zero in the dispersion relation. Let's rewrite the dispersion relation where this time the left hand side must go to zero since k must go to zero. The solution for omega now has this form. There are two solutions to the dispersion relation where omega c has a plus or minus in front of it. Let's take a look at each of these two solutions. The expression with the plus sign is labeled as omega r and is given by this. This is known as the right hand cutoff on the dispersion relation diagram, thus the subscript r. The other solution with the minus sign in front of omega c is known as the left hand cutoff. Now let's get the dispersion relation for an electromagnetic wave that travels parallel to the applied magnetic field. So the wave vector k has to be parallel to b naught. We go about obtaining the dispersion relation in the usual way. That is, we must first solve Maxwell's equations for this situation and then linearize the fluid equations which would then be coupled to Maxwell's equations. We finally obtain two solutions to the dispersion relation called an R wave and an L wave. A plot of the dispersion relations is given here. The L wave is given by the dashed lines and the R wave by the solid lines. An interesting region of this dispersion curve is shown here of the R wave. These waves are known as Whistler waves. As you can see that below omega c on 2, the higher frequencies have the higher phase velocity v phi. And this frequency range is in the audible range if the electromagnetic wave can be picked up by a radio receiver. And they sound like a series of descending whistling tones, thus the name Whistler waves. Let's look at how they could arise. So Whistler waves are the lower frequencies of the R wave that can propagate in the ionosphere. Here is a schematic diagram of the Earth with, say, plasma caught in the Van Allen belts in the ionosphere, given here by A, B, and C. If you have a lightning strike in the right place, then an electromagnetic wave will travel parallel to the field lines, but the higher frequencies will reach the pole of the Earth sooner than the lower frequencies and therefore you'll hear descending whistling tones if you had an appropriate radio receiver. We're now going to look at a class of waves known as hydromagnetic waves, in particular the alphane waves. These are electromagnetic waves that pass through the plasma, just as in the last example. However, this time we assume that the ions can move. In previous examples, we assumed that the ions were stationary. Just as in the previous example, we assume that the electromagnetic wave travels along a magnetic field line, which means it has a wave vector k that's parallel to b naught. Then we go through the same procedure of solving Maxwell's equations and the linearized fluid equations in order to obtain the dispersion relation. For details about how to do this, See section 4.18 of Chen. We finally obtain the following dispersion relation. Where the left hand side, omega on k, is nothing more than the phase velocity, v phi, and the right hand side is quite a curious expression for such a dispersion relation. Because as you'll notice, on the right hand side you'll see a dependence on the magnetic field b naught and the mass density rho. So from this we can see that regardless of the frequency of the wave, the phase velocity is going to be the same, provided the mass density and the magnetic fields don't change. This behavior is in sharp contrast to the previous cases that we've been looking at. Let's look at the physical picture of an alphane wave. We find that the plasma and the magnetic field lines move together in a transverse motion to the direction of the wave. In the previous cases, the magnetic field lines were unaffected by the plasma. But in this case, not only does the plasma moves, but it moves in synchronization with the magnetic field lines, 
at right angles to the direction of motion of the wave. It's almost like treating the magnetic field line like a plucked string.